to the glorious Father, as the covenant God of Israel, to the gracious Son, the Redeemer of his people, to the Holy Ghost, the author of sanctification, be everlasting praise for that gospel of the free grace of God, herein proclaimed unto men.
from ostentation as from weakness free. It stands like the sky blue arch we see. Majestic in its own simplicity. Inscribed above the portal from afar. Conspicuous as the brightness of a star. Legible only by the light they give. Stand the soul quickening words. Believe and live. Too many, shocked at what should charm them must. Despise the plain direction and are lost. Heaven on such terms. They cry with proud disdain. Incredible. Impossible and vain. Rebel because tis easy to obey. And scorn, for its own sake, the gracious way. 3. Thirdly, in the true preaching of the gospel, this simplicity is preserved. Paul expressly said, Having this hope in us, we use great plainness of speech. And again, my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. The Apostle Paul was a deep thinker, a man of profound insight and subtle mind. The bent of his mind was such that he would have made a metaphysician of supreme rank, or a mystic of the deepest darkness, but he went against his natural inclinations and devoted all his energies to the unveiling of the gospel. It was a sublime self-denial for him to put on one side all his logic among the other things which he counted loss for Christ, for he says, I determined not to know anything among men save Jesus Christ and him crucified. He determined. He was resolute and had made up his mind to it, or he would not have accomplished it. He was the man who wrote some things hard to be understood, which Peter mentions, but when he came to the gospel, he would have nothing but simplicity. He was tender among them as a nurse with her child and made himself an instructor of babes, dealing out the word of God with such plainness as children would require. The true man of God will not veil the gospel beneath performances and ceremonies. Mark those who do this and avoid them. We see his reverence walking with clasped hands to the right and to the left, repeating Latin sentences unknown by the people. He turns and bobs, and turns again. We see his face for a moment and then his back. I suppose it is all meant for edification, but I, poor Creta, cannot find the least instruction in it, nor, as far as I can discover, do the people who are looking on. What do these little boys in pretty gowns, making such a smoke, mean? And what are these flowers and images on the altar? What a splendid cross is that which adorns the priest's back. It seems to be made of roses. The folks look on and some are wondering where he buys his lace, while others are speculating as to the quantity of wax which will be consumed in those candles every hour, and there is the end of it, Christ is veiled behind the millinery, if he is there at all. I know numbers who would disdain to do that and yet they hide their Lord under finery of language. It is a grand thing to mount aloft upon the wings of eloquence and display the glory of speech till you ascend, in a splendid peroration, as many another exhibition closes with fireworks. But this is not becoming to preachers of the Lord Jesus. I always tell our young men that one of their commandments should be, you shall not ramble on. To attempt anything grand in language when we are preaching salvation is to leave our proper work. Our one business is to tell out the gospel plainly. We deal in bread, not in flowers. Let tawdry ornaments be left to the stage or to the bar, where men amuse themselves or dispute for gain, or let these poor gewgaws be reserved for the senate where men will defend or denounce according as it suits their party. It is not ours to make their worse appear the better, or to hide the truth of God under floods of words. As for us, we are to hide ourselves behind the cross and make men know that Jesus Christ came to save the lost, and that if they believe in him they shall be saved at once and forever. If we do not make them know this, we have missed our mark, however grandly we have performed. 
What? Shall we become acrobats with words, or jugglers displaying wonders? Then God is insulted, his gospel is degraded and souls are left to perish. I venture to put in a word for myself and then leave this point. I can say with the apostle, I have used great plainness of speech and, therefore, if the gospel which I have preached is hidden, I have not produced the veil. I have used vulgar words when I thought that they would be better understood and I have told all sorts of simple stories when I thought I could make the gospel known. I have never used a hard word where I could help it. My one desire has been by manifesting the truth of God to touch your consciences and win your hearts. If you see not the light, it is not because I have hidden it from you. 4. With this we close. If the gospel is veiled to our hearers, it is a fatal sign. If our gospel is hid, it is hid to them that are lost. The God of this world has blinded their unbelieving eyes lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ should dawn upon them. Not to believe, understand, appreciate and accept the gospel is a sign of perishing. I want to put this very plainly to any here who say that they have not received the gospel because they cannot understand it and they see nothing remarkable in it. If you have heard it plainly preached, it is so plain in itself that if it is hid from your eyes it is because you are still in the gall of bitterness and in the bonds of iniquity. You who receive the gospel are saved. Faith is the saving token. If you believe that Jesus is the Christ, you are born of God, if you have accepted him as your saviour whom God sets forth as such, then you are saved. But if you say, no, I cannot see it, then your eyes are blinded and you are lost. The sun is bright enough, but those who have no sight are not enlightened. Do you say, I cannot receive the gospel? I need something more difficult? by sinful pride your judgment is perverted and your heart is hardened. While you are still among the unbelieving, you are still among the perishing, and the God of this world blindfolds you. O Spirit of God, convince men of this sin, that they believe not on Jesus Christ. This work is out of your servant's power, but, oh, you perform it. O oh, that our text, like a sharp knife, may cut deep and reach the conscience. May this truth of God pierce between the joints and marrow and discern the thoughts and intents of your hearts. According to the text, he that believes not on Jesus Christ is a lost man. God has lost you, you are not his servant. The church has lost you, you are not working for the truth. The world has lost you, really you yield no lasting service to it. You have lost yourself to right, to joy, to heaven. You are lost, 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 like the prodigal son when he was away from his father's house. You are lost like the sheep that went astray from the fold. It is not only that you will be lost, but that you are lost, for, he that believes not is condemned already, because he has not believed on the Son of God. Press those two words upon your conscience, condemned already, lost even now. You are perishing. That is to say, you are gradually passing into that condition in which you must abide forever as one that has perished before God and become utterly useless and dead. It is an appalling truth that this is proved by the fact that you do not understand the gospel, or, if you understand it, you do not appreciate it you do not see beauty or glory in it, or, if you do, in a measure appreciate it, and see some glory in it, yet it has never stirred your affection or drawn your heart towards its great subject. In a word, you have not come to trust in Jesus. He is the only one that you can trust to salvation and yet you reject him. It must be the simplest thing in all world to trust in Christ and yet you will not do that simple thing. Trust in him should be attended to at once and ought not to be delayed, and yet you have delayed for years. If faith brings salvation, why not have salvation? Why abide, still, in unbelief, 
in unbelief of the most glorious truth that God, himself, ever revealed to men, in unbelief of that which you dare not deny. Oh, what a condition to be in, willfully in darkness, shutting your eyes to the light of God. You are certainly lost. The Apostle explains how a man gets into that condition. He says that Satan, the god of this world, has blinded his mind. What a thought it is that Satan should set up to be God. Christ is the image of God. Satan is the imitator of God, he mimics God and holds an usurped power over men's minds and thoughts. To maintain his power, he takes great care that his dupes should not see the light of the gospel. The veils he uses are such as men's selfish hearts approve, for he speaks thus, if you were to become a Christian, you would never get on in the world. He claps a sovereign on each eye and then you cannot see, though the sun shines at midday. Pride binds a silken band across the eyes and thus, again, the light of God is excluded. Satan whispers, if you become a Christian, you will be laughed at. And he hoodwinks his victim with fear of ridicule. He has many a crafty device by which he perverts the human judgment till they cannot see that which is self-evident, and will not believe that which is unquestionable. He makes the gain of heaven to seem inconsiderable when weighed with the little loss which religion may involve. He hides from the soul the bliss of forgiven sin of adoption into God's family and the certainty of eternal glory by throwing dust into the eyes, so that the mind cannot look at things truthfully. What shall I say, in closing, but this, are you lost, any of you? Upon the showing of the text all of you are to whom the gospel is hidden. Well, but thank God you may yet be found, lost today, but you need not be lost tomorrow lost while sitting in these pews, but you may be found before you leave the tabernacle. The good shepherd has come to find his lost sheep. Have you any desire after him? Have you any wish to return to him? Then look to him with a trustful glance. You are not lost if so you look, nor shall you ever be. He that believes in Jesus is saved and saved eternally. Are any of you blinded? You must be so if the gospel is hid from you, so that you cannot see its brightness. Ah, but you need not remain in the dark. There is one here, today, who opens blind eyes. Cry to him as did the two blind men, You, son of David, have mercy on me. You, son of David, have mercy on me. The Messiah came on purpose to give sight to the blind. It was a part of his commission when he came forth from the Father's glory. He will give sight to you. O oh, seek it. Is the God of this world your master? He must be if you do not see the glory of the gospel. But he need not be your God any longer. I pray the Holy Spirit to help you to dethrone this intruder. Why should you adore him? What good has he ever done for you? What is there about his character that makes him worthy to be your God? Break off his yoke. Burst the fetters which now hold you his slave. The true God has come in the flesh to set you free and to destroy all the works of the devil. Whatever keeps you from beholding the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ can be removed. I am sent to say, in my master's name, whoever believes in him is not condemned he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Come now, and let us reason together, says the Lord, though your sins are as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow, though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Trust the Saviour, trust the incarnate God. Trust him now and trust him at once, and though a moment ago you were black as hell's midnight, you shall be clean and bright as heaven's eternal noon. In one instant sins that have taken you fifty years to accumulate shall disappear. The transgressions of all your days shall be plunged beneath the sea and shall be found no more. Only be willing and obedient, 
and yield yourselves up to the incarnate God who always lives to take care of those who put their trust in him. May the Lord bless you, dear friends, forevermore. Amen and Amen.